Welcome to the opening night of camp meeting. <clears throat> Every year when we get to the end of camp meeting, I'm always a little surprised and I always feel like, wow, it's gone by so quickly. What happened to, uh, what happened to the week? It's already gone. And I feel the same way this year. But this has been a bit of an unusual camp meeting, hasn't it? It's been unlike any camp meeting we've, we've had prior to this. And friends, as enjoyable as it has been, and I hope it has been a blessing to you, I will say I hope that next year we're back under the big tent. Um, it, will, it will be a joy to um, conclude the final night of camp meeting with announcements to stack chairs and, and hymnals once again. Um, we don't have to do that this evening. That's the good news. The bad news is, is uh, we don't get to shake hands and, and hug each other and, and, you know, lay eyes on each other um, as we would as if we were having camp meeting as usual. Our theme this week has been uh, 2020 vision, and we've been talking about and praying that God would open the eyes of our hearts, that we could see the world as Jesus sees the world, that we would see people as he sees people, that we would be patient and gracious with each other, that we would also see ourselves as God sees us. We are his beloved children. He loves us more than we can imagine, and um, we need to see ourselves in that light as well. It transforms the way we look at ourselves and the way that we look at our world. Our text throughout camp meeting has been Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, which reads, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Isn't that an awesome passage? And so we pray today that God will open the eyes of our heart, that as we see the world, we see it as Jesus sees it. I would be remiss if I did not um, share some thanks to um, people who have been so dedicated and diligent um, in, in making camp meeting happen this year. Um, first of all, Elders Jim Gilley and Elder Lonnie Meloshenko. Uh, those two gentlemen have been a blessing to us as they have been our featured speakers on each of the weekends. I also want to thank our seminar presenters, uh, Pastors Cornell Prada, Phil and Brenda Johnson, um, Scott Christensen, Rob Rice, Dr. Zach and Kim Mazzoni, Garrett and Katrina McClarty. Thank you for um, your willingness to serve and, and feed the flock in northern New England. I also want to thank our AV team. Um, Joseph Lee has been instrumental in making this uh, reality for you. I want to thank Joseph. I also want to thank Brian and Allison Panette, uh, the AV uh, leaders at the Brunswick Church, and they have been here for every single seminar, every evening meeting, and um, we're just so thankful for the Panettes as well. Uh, none of this would have been possible without your AV team. Without them, I would just be talking to an empty room tonight. So we're very thankful for their expertise and their, and their faithfulness. I also want to thank my assistant, Belle Askenazi. You know, Belle is uh, the brains behind the scenes, and she takes care of all of the details and makes sure that everything fits together and works together. So I want to thank Belle for that as well. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank each of you. Um, you are the unsung heroes of northern New England. You are the folks that uh, are sharing the message on a day-to-day -day basis with the people that you meet. And it is your life and your commitment to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the ministry of the church that makes everything possible. It is because of you that we will one day see power return to the east and the outpouring of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit in this historic territory. And so I want to thank you for your faithfulness in everything that God has gifted you with. So as we um, continue with our worship service uh, this evening, 
our final camp meeting service, we're going to have a couple of congregational hymns for you. The first one is Come Christians, Join to Sing. But before we do that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we've had this opportunity to experience camp meeting. And Lord, it's been bittersweet because we haven't been able to, to see each other and hug each other and, and shake hands as we normally do. Um, but it's been a good experience nonetheless. We have learned, we have grown closer to you through this week, and we pray that that would be our continual experience, that we would be just more like Jesus every single step and every single day of our lives. May you bless Elder Lonnie Melashenko as he brings the word to us this evening. May you inspire our hearts through his ministry. And bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing.
Oh, that's fantastic. I just love those hymns, don't you? Were you singing along with me as, as, we, as the hymns were being played in your own living room? I was, I was certainly humming to myself here in the church. Um, tonight, we have a special um, uh, performance that is coming to us from the King's Trio. The King's Trio is comprised of Jeff Chase, Brendan Kruger, and Pastor James Reed. And they got their start as a trio uh, performing in The Greatest Gift, an evangelistic outreach that the Brunswick Church does to the, to the town of Brunswick. They played as the three wise men uh, in The Greatest Gift, and it started a, a beautiful partnership between those three gentlemen, and they are now known as the King's Trio. Tonight, they will be performing when it's all been said and done. Listen and enjoy. When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done All my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Lord, your mercy is so great That you look beyond our weakness And find purest gold in miry clay Making sinners into saints I will always sing your praise Here on earth and ever after For you show me heaven's my true home When it's all been said and done You're my life when love is When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? Lord, I live my Gentlemen, thank you so much. That was just fantastic. I love it. Love to hear the King's Trio sing. And it reminds me that um, uh, there was one other person I should have thanked for their faithful service at camp meeting this year, and that is uh, Mrs. Dottie Kruger. Uh, Dottie uh, worked diligently to once again uh, be responsible for the music at camp meeting. We are so thankful for Dottie. And by the way, at the close of tonight's meeting, we'll be um, singing our traditional song, uh, Never Part Again. Bradley and Brendan and Dottie will, 
will be uh, leading us in that uh, traditional uh, song that we use to close out camp meeting every year. So uh, be sure and, and stay on through uh, the close of the sermon and, and sing Never Part Again with us at the end of the message. Our message tonight is again brought, by, brought to us by Elder Lonnie Meloshenko. Uh, as, as we talked about last night, Lonnie has had a, a, a rich and um, just very uh, significant uh, career in serving the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Lord God, and he continues to do that uh, even in retirement. We're so thankful that Lonnie has been our speaker this evening. His message tonight is, What Hath God wrought. Please join me in, in welcoming Elder Lonnie Meloshenko to the Northern New England Conference Conference Pulpit. Welcome, Elder Meloshenko. Welcome to virtual camp meeting for the very first time ever in the history of the Northern New England Conference. I wanted to be here in person, but I'm doing the best I can by this virtual presentation. But wow, it doesn't take a rocket scientists to realize these are exciting times that we're living. These are frightening times. These are thrilling times because all of us know something is about to happen. I mean, the speed with which our world is tobogganing downhill into the apocalypse, it takes one's breath away. You know, when your conference executive committee and your president, it's now in Ohio, and your camp meeting committee invited me to preach for this year's camp meeting in Northern New England Conference. When I heard the incredible theme that you've selected, 2020 vision, I readily responded. I'm excited about that. So excited, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. In fact, I wish I had Miss Del Delker here to sing for me because Del is always the amen corner as I preach. You see, I was raised in a black church my father, Elder Joe Meloshenko, was ordained in a black church right here in the Atlantic Union. So when I preach in black churches, I'm kind of at home because there's an excitement, there's a power present, something's happening, it's dynamic. Everybody's talking out loud and saying amen all throughout the sermon. Well, for about five years now, I've been reading Ellen White's writings in those great big signs of the times and the Review and Herald articles where most of her writings are. I've found things I'd never dreamed in those writings. What she says about uh, God's people, the layman. She says the conference is, get out of the way, let the layman finish the work. But she says a lot about our white churches and our worship style. Now listen carefully because uh, if you go to the index of the writings of Ellen White under the title Worship, you'll find 14 pages of references to different things she says about our worship. Because you see, we came out of Millerism right here near Portland, Maine. And William Miller was a very, very conservative person. He didn't want anybody to make any decisions in his sermons based on hype or a lot of amens and a lot of emotion. He wanted to be a rational decision based on the evidence of the scripture. So no emotion in William Miller's services so that we came out of Millerism, we have been a very conservative. We don't clap, we don't applaud. <laughs> Ellen White came along and she says, you know what about our white worship? You read these references. It tires the angels. So when James White came along and some of our pioneers like Jan Loughborough, they would come down the aisle as the hymn started, clapping their hands, beating their time on the Bible, getting a little bit of an emotion. Because you see, God is worthy of all worship and all of our reverence and all of our response. And on Sabbath morning, she says, if we don't respond somehow, we're actually worshiping another power because Satan doesn't want God to receive that glory, that worship. Well, she also warned that we're not, not to go to extremes in worship. Some of the Adventists went to doing cartwheels in the aisles and so forth. But I want to make a little invitation for you as we start this sermon this morning to you conservative New Englanders. And I lived here in Springfield, Massachusetts for several years, the islands of Bermuda. I want you to spice up this camp meeting. Start your own little Pentecostal movement in your church and in your home, and then you would get, go to church, surprise the pastor by some amen corners in your church, okay? The title of my message today, as we talk about 2020, is What Hath God Wrought? I want to begin by asking you to bow your head and 
Let's ask God to bless our study. Father in heaven, it's, it's not enough for us to just study the Bible as other books. In order for us to be understood savingly, the Holy Spirit must move on our hearts as we search so that we do something after we study. And our prayer here is the rustling of the wings of the angels that are on their way bringing us the boons of heaven. May we, wherever we're watching just now, see and hear the angel in our house as the chariot wheels rumble in prayer. We pray in Jesus' name, and we thank you. Amen. I always like to know about certain things in history that have been happening about the time when I preach just this last few months. Something uniquely parallel to William Miller in giving the Great Advent Movement gospel ring here. Something happened on May 24, 1844, the year William Miller was preaching around here. That same year, Samuel E.B. Morse, who invented Morse code, he opened the first U.S. telegraph line in 1844 between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. From the U.S. Capitol building, Morse sent to Baltimore the very first officially telegraphed words, What hath God wrought? What hath God wrought? I mean, using media and Zoom and this very worship service here at camp meeting, an online link to get the message out to northern New England. What hath God wrought? But I want to probe a little deeper with that question. What does all of this mean since one germ, one virus, one coronavirus shut down our camp meeting, shut down airlines, closed international borders, closed churches, hospitals, Wall Street, the state of New York. What does all this mean? COVID-19, disease and economic meltdown, social distancing, fines for not wearing a mask, penalties for going to the beach, or fines to even go to church in America? What hath God wrought? There's one key scripture text I'd like to have us think about. And if you have your Bibles, please take and look back there near close to the book of Revelation, the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. For our thought this morning, I want to focus on this passage. The Apostle Peter, he shares some profound implications for people facing fear. We've just had a lot of total chaos in America with the untimely death of a certain George Floyd. Our cities, not only in this country, but around North America, around the world. Fear. Pandemic. Peter himself experienced cataclysmic calamity, colossal pandemics in his life too. So hold on to your seats. Remember? Yes? Big mouth, big fisherman. Quick temper and fear. Yes, the apostle Peter experienced hurricane-like storms out there on the Sea of Galilee. He experienced social distancing big time. Remember? Crossing over to Gadara and facing head-on those naked, wild, demon-possessed men rushing down on their boat with their chains, tempestuous, Satan infected with no human vaccine, raging, shrieking, terror-stricken with fear. The college of the uh, cardinals, the disciples, they plunge into the water to keep six feet of social distance. Fear. Oh, and remember brave Peter in Pilate's judgment hall? Fear to even identify with Jesus. It's Peter. Curses, swears, denies his Lord with oaths and imprecations. But wait, listen. This is the same Peter who, despite the Niagara of failures, yet, incredibly, he walked on water. Peter, 
in Gethsemane with Jesus. Peter, uniquely privileged to be on the Mount of Transfiguration, honored to see Moses, Elijah, privileged above all the others. What's going on here? What hath God wrought? Is there a vaccine here for us this year in 2020 Northern New England camp meeting? Listen. Peter deals with this question for those of us facing calamity, disaster, coronavirus, fears of jobs lost, health, death, no funerals, no food, no income, insecurity. Peter asks us, what does all this mean? Ah, I know. Yes, Peter says, yes, I saw miracles. Yes, I walked on water. Yes, I saw Moses and Elijah. But listen up, folks, in Northern New England Conference in 2020, celebrating church via Twitter and Zoom and virtual camp meeting here. Listen up if you Millerite descendants who talk on cell phones or iPads or tweet or text messages due to Samuel Morse's developing telecommunications in 1844 at the same time as William Miller was counting down October 22 and the second coming. Listen up Portland, coronavirus victims. Listen up America, reeling under the race riots and carnage and unbelievable civil rights deb debacles with the horrifying death of African American George Floyd. Peter says in 2020, the best is just ahead. God isn't caught short. Friend, this is God's finest hour, your finest hour. Because notice the text. Because we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecies came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Folks, remember? Remember? In just one week, our world, planet Earth, plunged into darkness, disease, pandemic, a dark place, the curtain of death. And the speed with which our world tobogganed downhill into these end times with coronavirus, and these riots in the streets, takes one's breath away. Like what happened back there in the dark ages after Peter and Paul and the apostles died. Remember, rites and ceremonies and practices crept into the church, which Paul or Peter never heard of, propaganda fake news. In just one week, in May, one day, with the death of George Floyd under the knee of a white police officer until he begged, I can't breathe. Peter says, listen. Listen up, Northern New England. Time out. Pay attention. It's happening today, too, that ye take heed, Peter says, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. It's dark out there, friend. Our world, our nation, our city, our neighborhoods, our homes. We're right now in a dark place like never ever before in all of history. We're now in the long dark night of sin. Oh, yes, the theaters want to reopen, and many neon Hollywood Las Vegas lights are gleaming. The Great White Way, Times Square, Tinseltown, the boardwalk. But few, if any, of those lights mark the pathway to heaven and to life and light. Well, you say, don't we have TV news updates and editorials and and the pundits and the White House task force, health team, and CNN and Fox News to help guide us? 
No, friend, these aren't lights. Be honest. Not even politicians and senators and even preachers. We live in a culture today of liars and darkness. Even news tells us that. The politicians tells us that. God's Word tells us they are the combustion of noxious gases rising from the miasma of pestilential morasses which lead hapless wanderers into sloughs of despond and suicide and fear and terror. They leave millions today in total darkness, perishing in nursing homes, hungry, homeless, hopeless, not just wandering in the streets. Open your eyes. Myriads are now wandering in mazes of doubt, skepticism, error, suicide, and total political uncertainty. America is in a meltdown. So now the big question, who is the cause of all of this? China? A laboratory in Wuhan? Listen, there's a very significant statement from a little third grader who never finished school right here in Maine, not far from here. But remember in Matthew 24, Jesus used a unique New Testament word telling about end time last day prophecies, remember? It's a word rarely used in Scripture and even more scarcely used today in modern times because it's so rare. Jesus predicted, Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Pestilences. Pestilences. Webster's Dictionary says any contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is virulent and devastating. Specifically, it names the bubonic plague. Wow! Virulent? That means a virus without a cure. Pandemic. But now from a little girl with only a third grade education written right here in New England. I'm reading from Great Controversy, page 589 and 590. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he, that's Satan, will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Look at New York. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. Now notice, he imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. And then she says this, these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. And then she even adds this, Destruction will be upon both man and beast. What does all this mean? I sent a note to the editor of the Ellen White estate, Jim Nix. He's retired now. About Ellen White's references to civil rights and to the race riots toward the end of time. You go and look those up. There's several pages of references too frightening to share online here and on this presentation with you. But I want to tell you, friend, in terms of pestilences and all kinds of commotion, the worst is yet to come. 
2 Peter 1, 19 to 21 says, Ye take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Well, friend, there's good news. Saints, there's going to be light. The day star can arise this very moment in our sermon in your heart. Listen up. Blessed be God that he has given us the sure light that shines in our long, dark night. This book illuminates the path of life even to the end, even in the face of COVID-19. There's divine assurances here. See, friend, God cannot lie. He says, friend, in faith and humility, you today have the right to claim God's promises, to ask God to grant us and to grant you the guidance of that same Holy Spirit power who inspired prophecy, the same power that created the world, that same power to help you. One third of this book is prophecy. That means it's a guiding light into the future for America, for Canada, for Mexico, for Northern New England, for the world. Can you say amen? What hath God wrought? What does all this COVID-19 mean? Race and violence and America's major cities carnage by evil and paid hoodlums? Listen, friend, Peter says it means simply, we have the more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well to take heed. Can you hear Peter? Hey, friend. Hey, Northern New England. Time to take God seriously. Time to get back to the word, back to Bible study, back to prayer. Time to fulfill the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. To worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. Are you listening? One more scripture here before we close. Turn over to Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says there that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily. Uh, we have a lot of things going on in politics now as we're getting up for the grand big election. And the pollsters are always there. We have the Lou Gallup, uh, Lou Harris, and the Gallup polls. We've got Reuters. Well, there is a pollster for religious trends that's called Barna Research. I usually don't quite like what he comes up with, but he's usually right. Well, Barna talks about Seventh-day Adventists. He says, you know, Adventists used to be known as the people of the book. Boy, Adventists knew their Bible. You didn't get into a debate back in those early days of Ellen White and William Miller with an Adventist because they'd always win, hands down. They knew their Bible. He says, Adventists used to read their Bibles every single day, no exception. I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed to tell you this, but Barna says that Adventists don't do that anymore. In fact, of all the denominations right around you here in Maine, we're 14th on the list. Other denominations read the Bible much more than the Adventists. That's very sad. Something else. There's a Dr. Arlene Taylor. She's out of St. Helena Hospital in Northern California. She's a brain specialist. And uh, she has done some research on reading spiritual things and especially on prayer. You know, when I took chaplaincy course at Loma Linda Hospital. The doctors and the, the specialists, the surgeons, always like it when a chaplain or an imam or a priest comes into the hospital and prays because the patient seems to do better. But never were they able to scientifically research and in, in scientific laboratories measure, see how prayer makes a difference. Now, brain surgeons and, and specialists who are not faith-believing people have done studies that actually put little electrodes on your brain and on your mind and 
You know, and Ellen White even talks about this, that when you pray, there's an impulse, an electrical pulse that God must hear in his cosmic sensor. But when you pray for somebody in a hospital down there in Orlando, Florida, maybe in the emergency room, they might even be in, in uh, intensive care. They don't even know. Scientists have now put little electrodes on that person's brain and your brain. When you pray, something happens in the brain of that person you're praying for. These are in blind studies. It's now scientifically known that prayer has power. Prayer works. Prayer changes brain cells and increases certain brain activity, especially praise prayers. And then Dr. Taylor says something about reading spiritual things out loud. And by the way, it has to be out loud. Science has now discovered that when you do some devotional reading, when you read some devotional book, out loud for 12 minutes a day. It has to be every single day for 12 minutes. Are you ready for this? Folks, science now shows that you can actually impact and perhaps even reverse dementia and profoundly impact Alzheimer's. That's why Jeannie and I have the Andrews University Study Bible that has the, all the little notes at the bottom. We can't wait to get our Sabbath school lesson and read and we read out loud we're right now reading through the conflict of the ages series we just got into just this year we're up to desire of ages reading out loud makes a difference peter appeals to us this year at the northern new england camp meeting we're focusing on 2020 vision peter says folks get back to the bible Get back to reading something out loud spiritually, devotionals with your family in the morning. Get back to praying out loud. It's interesting, too, that Ellen White, in those writings I've been reading, Signs of the Times, October 28, 1897, she said, you know, we, we use only one-third of our talents. If we use a third of what our talents enable us to do, she says, with the other two-thirds of our powers, we're working against Christ. Wow. Time to get serious. What hath God wrought? COVID-19, friends, is a unique time in history. It's a unique invitation, a unique opportunity, not just for America. It's a time for the world to sit up and take notice. Time for you, as Peter says, to take heed. Time for perspective. May I be honest? Jeannie and I have been listening almost every day faithfully to the president of the White House with Dr. Tony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks and the political right and the political left trying to read between the explosive politics on the right and the left between CNN and Fox News. It's hard to discern between what's a real threat and what's just simple panic and political hysteria, right? Having perspective is good, but using it is better. Peter reminds us, Lonnie, listen up. This word gives us perspective because the final movements will be rapid ones. Press together, press together, press together. These are exciting times. These are frightening times. These are thrilling times. All of us know something is about to happen. Shall we pray? Lord Peter speaks with authority. And he says to us, Scripture, profoundly important for us in 2020. It's the voice of God speaking to our soul, stirring, pleading, Startling supernatural times are before us, and it's, it's fatal to be careless and indifferent. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry, says the word. So, Lord, we cannot afford to be disobedient to God's invitation that he's giving us here today. If we refuse, we shall have no probation. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. God or mammon? Lord, right now, while it's still today, help us to respond out loud 
And say it together with me as we close this appeal. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you just like to say that out loud with me? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. again no never part again what never part again no never part again and soon we shall with Jesus reign again no never part again what never part again no never part again and soon we shall with Jesus again what never part again no never part again and 
soon we shall with Jesus reign and never, never part again. I can't wait for that day. How about you? When we never part again. It just brings to mind all of those that we love that we have laid to rest, anxiously awaiting the resurrection when Jesus breaks through the clouds and comes to take us home to heaven. Friends, let's keep our eyes on that prize and let us again pray that the Lord will open the eyes of our heart that we may see heavenly realities and not worry over earthly ones. Let's pray together as we close camp meeting. Gracious Father in heaven, never part again. That is the longing of every heart that is tuning in this evening. We cannot wait until Jesus comes to take us home. And Lord, we pray that you would come quickly. We have waited far too long, but we trust in you and we trust in your timeline. We know that you will come at just the right time. And so, Lord, give us patience, give us anticipation, and prepare our hearts to receive you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, and God bless everyone. Next year, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll see you in the big tent.